Wendy and I spent a couple of days at uh, Cumberland Falls, Friday night, Saturday. We went with our daughter Emily. She was taking some pictures there, some wedding photos. And I met a guy from Illinois uh, who had one of these. You probably haven't seen one of these because they're fairly new in the United States, as I understand it. Uh, but this guy was very proud of this trike. I just call them a three-wheeled motorcycle. But uh, he was pulling it off of a, a trailer there at the lodge where we were staying, and he proceeded to tell me all about it. And I thought to myself, what a sleek machine this thing is. I mean, uh, sitting here um, in this parking lot, I mean, this thing, it just seemed like it was almost ready to just roar to life. Uh, I mean, just a marvel, no doubt, of engineering. This thing boasts the latest technology, top of the line features. It's a symbol of speed and luxury and efficiency. I wasn't envious of this guy. I didn't sin. Because I tried to get him to tell me how much it cost, and he wouldn't say. So I, I figured, well, it was more than my bicycle. So I didn't envy him too much. But as impressive as this motorcycle was, it remained motionless, sitting there in front of me, silent, inert. And you know why? Because in that guy's pocket was resting a single unassuming object that was the key to unlocking this machine's potential. And if this clicker will work, you'll see what I'm talking about. That little thing right there. Key fob. That key, no bigger than the palm of your hand, that was the linchpin, that was the crucial element that bridged the gap between the potential of this machine and the action of this machine. Without that key fob, this motorcycle, no matter how advanced, no matter how finely tuned or elegant, this thing may be, it is rendered utterly powerless without that key. And just like that key, just as it is indispensable to that motorcycle functioning, there are certain essential elements in the Christian life that are also indispensable. And that's what we're talking about in this series. We're talking about five indispensable things these are things that you cannot do without and be a faithful follower of the Lord. These are things that you absolutely must have. In the first lesson, we talked about faith. Faith is the primary thing. In fact, the Bible says that faith is indispensable to pleasing God. Without faith, you cannot please God. In the second lesson, we talked about works. Now, when we say works, we're talking about obedient actions. And just as... Just as faith is indispensable to pleasing God, works are indispensable to showing our faith. Today we're going to talk about another indispensable element, and that element is love. Love is indispensable to the Christian life. Just as faith is indispensable to pleasing God, just as works are indispensable to showing our faith, Love is indispensable to our works. In fact, that's the argument that the Apostle Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In the great love chapter, he talks about the great things that a person may do. And then he says, having done them without love renders those things utterly ineffective. He's saying it comes to nothing. Look at 1 Corinthians 13 here, verses 1 and 2. Paul said, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love. I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm just making a bunch of noise. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, you talk about faith, enough to move mountains, but do not have love. He said, I'm nothing. I'm nothing without that. Now this is important in the greater context of the book of 1 Corinthians because the Corinthians have been in doubt, as Randy was talking about in the first session this morning, with spiritual gifts. 
And they had received these gifts by the Spirit of God, but they were using them without love for one another. Instead, there were feelings of jealousy among the Christians at Corinth. There was a, a, an attitude of superiority. There was a competition going on between these brethren. And all of that prompted Paul to show the nature of the love that ought to motivate Christians in their work. In the work that they do, whatever those works are, Paul is writing 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as he comes to the conclusion of the book to say, all the things that you may do, they are nothing if they're not motivated by love. I want to talk to you this morning for a little bit about what love does and what love doesn't do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 going on in verses 4 through 7, Paul writes these words, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now I've been reading uh, this passage of Scripture for several weeks now and uh, my focus mainly has been on my own shortcomings with a view to improve because I know that in this context I need to improve. God knows that I do. I'm seeking God's grace and God's power to turn this biblical truth into real life for me. And I hope that you will pray that prayer as well as we're journeying this year uh, towards spiritual growth as a congregation, as individual Christians. May it be our prayer that God would help us to make this biblical truth real to our lives. Especially 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 through 7. But I've looked at this passage of Scripture. Here's the question in my mind. What is Paul doing here? What is he doing here in this passage of Scripture? Paul says 15 things about what love does and does not do. Now you ponder this list and you may find it to be peculiar. I know that I do. I mean, if you come to expect 1 Corinthians chapter 13 to be a definition of love, it just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work very well as a definition of love. Because some crucial things seem to be missing out of this chapter. Just think about other places in the scripture where the core of love is defined. Such as John chapter 15 verse 13 where Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, this what? That someone lays down his life for his friends. Here's the helpfulness of love. Here's an action motivated by love. Laying down one's life for his friends. How about 1 John 4, 10? It says, in this is love. This what? Well, that he loved us, that is God loved us, and sent his son to be the propitiation or atoning sacrifice for our sins. Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us in that, in that what? In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. At the core, at the core of love is a self-sacrificing pursuit of the beloved's greatest good. Now the beloved in my life, uh, in terms of human relationships, that would be Wendy. She is the beloved. And what does love do? Well, love saves, love rescues, love helps. And it does so, if necessary, at the cost of the lover. Love does these kinds of things. But this core element of helping one another, that's not the stress of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. But what Paul does do is, Paul groups up these 15 elements into three categories. There are two big categories. The first one are statements about how love is durable. These, these statements just simply describe that love does not ever give up. And then the second major category, those statements are about how love is not proud. Love isn't prideful. Thirteen of the fifteen elements seem to fit into these two categories, in my humble view. Of the remaining two elements, one of them kind of comes close to this proactive helpfulness 
of these other verses that we've read as opposed to reactive patience, but namely these other two are kindness, love is kind, and the other stresses that love rejoices when truth holds sway. When truth advances, uh, love rejoices. So here's one way to categorize what love does and what love doesn't do in terms of, of its enduring quality and in, in, in terms of it not being fragile. Love is patient. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. It endures all things. In terms of how humble love is, that it, it's not proud, Paul says it isn't envious. It, doesn't, it isn't boastful. It isn't arrogant or puffed up. It isn't rude. It doesn't have an offending mannerism. It, is, it doesn't assist, insist on its own way or doesn't seek its own. It isn't irritable or not easily peeved. It isn't resentful and it doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. And then just under that last little category, pro-kindness and truth, it just simply comes down to this. It is kind and it rejoices with the truth. Now what I conclude from this is that Paul isn't really trying to define love in the abstract so much. He's laying down, if you will, he's laying down love as a grid over these messed up Corinthian Christians in the church there. He sees all their wrong behaviors that he's trying to correct. And Paul says, in essence, your attitudes and your behaviors are not how love acts. This is not the way love feels. This is not the way love lives. Now we kind of preach through the book of 1 Corinthians sometime back, at least major portions of it. And when you look at the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll find out early on that they were boastful in men. And boasting in men was leading to divisions in the, in the uh, Christian uh, uh, fellowship there. Chapter 3, verse 21. They were also puffed up in wrongdoing. In chapter 5, with the fornicating brother, they would, they would not require this person to repent. They were unwilling to suffer long and bear all kinds of things. And so they were taking each other to court. In chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, they were insisting on their own way and eating meat that caused others to stumble. In chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, they were acting in a way that was rude or unseemly, not wearing the customary head covering. In chapter 11, verses 1 through 16, they were insisting on their own way as they ate their own meal at the Lord's Supper without any regard for the others. In chapter 11, verses 21 and 22, and they were also very jealous and envious as they compared their spiritual gifts with each other and they thought that some spiritual gifts were needed and others were not. In chapter 12, verses 21 and 22. In other words, Paul is not defining love. Paul is applying love to the Corinthian situation and he's using it as the criteria for why some of their attitudes and behaviors was unacceptable in the sight of God. But this isn't less useful for us because we're, we're understanding how it applied to the church at Corinth. No, this, this is very relevant for you and me, these categories that we're looking at here. They're for us. I mean, the first category, the one about endurance, it says that wherever there's love, there's also pain. Have you not noticed that? I mean, even in the context of our fellowship here, Paul says love suffers long or it endures all things, it bears all things. This is very simply realism. This is comforting as well to know that when there are uh, two people or maybe 75 people or 2,000 people, I mean, when you put these people together in a relationship of love, every single one of those people will be hurt. Every single one of them will experience pain. And all the others then will need to suffer long and endure and bear up under that weight that that person uh, is bearing under. It strikes me as amazing that this was, this was uh, so prominent in Paul's treatment of love here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And so I'm praying and I'm asking all of you to pray very hard that we would be good lovers in this way. Amen. That we would give less offense and that we would take less offense with our dear brothers Amen. and sisters in Christ. And then even more penetrating is the major emphasis here on pride. 
Uh, it's not surprising that the opposite of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is not hate, it's pride. Pride is the opposite of love. The main category of what love does, what it does not do is arrogance. I mean, boasting, seeking its own way. And so we set ourselves to examine ourselves and we pray once again, O oh Lord, reveal pride in me and destroy it in my life. Right. That should be our prayer. Amen. And of course, even though they're small in category, the other two elements of love, they're huge. Be kind and be happy about the prevailing of truth. I mean, you as a Christian, you should, if you're a loving person, in the context of our fellowship here, you should rejoice today that God's Word is being preached from this pulpit. Amen. And that uh, starting tomorrow night, there will be a revival meeting under a tent where God's Word will be preached. And this community, uh, to some extent, will be evangelized. And then next Sunday, we have a gospel preacher coming, Brother Deason, who will preach the words of life to us again. And we teach God's Word here. And we have a Bible teaching program here and all of God's people should rejoice that this work is going forth, and it's going forth not out of pride and arrogance, but out of love. Mm -hmm. Love for God and love for the souls of men. That should be our prayer. Oh Lord, reveal pride in me. Destroy pride. Help me to be loving in this way and help me to be kind to others and love the prevailing of truth. what love does and does not do. Uh, those are some good categories. But that begs the question, how can I become this type of loving person? Listen. Um, I'm going to tell you something here. not going to be easy. If you're going to become this loving person, you're going to have to die. Because in the scripture, a call to love is a call to death. I want you to look at John chapter 12 here, what the Lord said in verses 24 through 26. John chapter 12, verses 24 through 26. He says to his disciples, Truly, truly, I say to you, and you can underscore this, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. Now, he's not really talking about wheat here. He's talking about the behavior of his disciples and the good that they may or may not do in their lives. So he says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now there are four great promises in these few verses and there are four great life-shaking demands. First of all, he says your life will bear fruit. That's a great promise, but only if it falls like a seed into the ground and dies. He says you'll keep your life for eternal life. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? But he said only if you hate your life in this world. He says, you'll be with me where I am. Now, Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. And when he's talking about them being where he is, he's talking about them getting up on a cross and dying with him. He's talking about the journey to Calvary. He says, you'll be with me where I am if you follow me to Calvary. And then you'll be with me in glory because that's where Jesus is now. Right. And then he says, God the Father will honor you that is, if you serve me, if you serve Jesus. Great promises, life-shaking demands. Here's the question. How then can I, as a husband and father, 
How can I, as a preacher and an elder in the local church, how can I, as a man, how can I die in order that my life might bear fruit? Well, I'll tell you. Jesus said it's through dying. We're talking about spiritual growth in our lives personally and in the Lord's church here locally. And I hope that we are all praying for a revival. We sang a song about revival this morning. And I'm going to tell you, we will see that revival with fruit-bearing power when dying precedes the revival. Dying first. That is me dying to me and you dying to you that we might live for Him who loved us and called us through the Gospel. That's what Jesus is teaching here. And this is the only way that you can become a great lover like Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If we are to see Christ and show Christ in our lives this summer, this year, or any time, we must first die with Christ. Now here's a question. We already talked about how necessary works are to faith. Faith without works are dead, being alone, James says. So let me ask you, does John chapter 12, verses 24 through 26 contradict John 3, 16? You know, someone might hear what I'm teaching or what Jesus has said here in John chapter 12 and ask, well, is this a contradiction of salvation through faith? Is what Jesus, is what He's teaching here, is this a contradiction to that? I mean, Jesus is saying not just believe only. Jesus is saying, no, die to bear fruit. Jesus is saying, hate your life in this world in order to have eternal life. Jesus is saying, follow me to where I will be at the cross and in glory and serve me in order that the Father might honor you. <laughs> what becomes of John 3.16 then? In John 3.16, Jesus earlier said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Which is it? Believe on Jesus for everlasting life or die to yourself in this to your life in this world to have everlasting life. I mean, now here in John chapter 12, Jesus says, He who hates his life in this world shall keep it to eternal life. So do we have eternal life by believing on Jesus or by hating our lives in this world? Does John chapter 12, verse 25 contradict John 3, 16? I'm telling you, friend, the answer to that question is no. That is not a contradiction. John chapter 12, verse 25 defines John chapter 3, verse 16. What Jesus means by believe on me is something much deeper and more life-changing than what people in the religious world often realize because many of the religious world think that believing on Jesus means just to give mental assent to Him, just to acknowledge Him, and that's all that's required, or that's all that one can possibly do. But friend, that's not what Jesus is teaching. One of the great passions of my life, especially now, is to discover what true saving faith, what that is, and to learn how to live by faith, and to help others to know what saving faith is, and to live by faith. And friend, I'm telling you, when Jesus says that we have eternal life by believing on Him, and then says that we have eternal life if we hate our lives in this world, He is not nullifying faith. He is clarifying faith. Amen. When He says that we must die like seed in the ground, we must hate our lives in this world, that we must take up our cross and follow Him on this Calvary road, and that we must serve Him instead of material things or money, since no one can serve two masters, what Jesus is doing is He is describing the way faith lives. And that's what Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He's not defining love so much as He is showing us how faith lives. That's why He can attach the same promise to this way of life that He attaches to faith. Believe on Jesus and you will not perish but have eternal life. Hate your life in this world. You'll keep it for eternal life. First, the promise of eternal life is given to the act of believing. And then the promise of eternal life is given to the act of hating your life. 
and all that goes with that in this world. And the reason why both of those are true is that hating your life in this world is what faith always does. Always. True faith, that's what it always does. You see, true faith, saving faith, treasures Christ so deeply that the competing treasures of this earth die to us and we die to them. This death to the world results in decisions. We make decisions that often look to the world as if though we hate our life. You know what I mean? Jesus said, we talked about this Wednesday night in our Bible study. Jesus says in Luke chapter 14, if a man does not hate his father, mother, his wife, children, and yea, even his own life, Jesus said he cannot be my disciple. We know that he didn't mean to hate them in terms of feeling hate for these people close to his family. In fact, the Bible teaches us to love our family. But what Jesus is saying is that we should die to ourselves in this world to the extent that when the world looks at the decisions that we're making, it would appear to them as though we hate our lives. I mean, they think we hate our lives, don't they? Because we come to this place every first day of the week instead of going, I don't know, to the lake or... Uh, hanging out with our family or sleeping in or whatever other activities we might uh, find to do. They think we hate our lives. Don't they love their life? Don't they love to seek adventure? Don't they love sleeping in? Don't they love taking time off? And these people read their Bible and when they talk to you, they give you book, chapter, and verse. Is that all those people do is study the Bible? Don't they love their life enough to pursue other things? I mean the decisions that a person makes because they have a life of faith will look to the world as if though they hate their life. And Jesus says in order for you to have eternal life, friend, you must have the kind of faith that would lead you to die to your life here in this world. By dying to this world, you're not earning or meriting eternal life through the rigors of Spiritual disciplines, you cannot earn or merit anything from God because God owns you. God owns everything that you think you own. You cannot give God anything that God does not already have. Salvation is by grace. But let me tell you something. It is by grace through faith. Amen. We've just seen how faith lives. Haven't we? Now, this is what it comes to as far as 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 4 through 7 comes. Hating our lives in the sense that Jesus is referring to enables us then to love each other. Instead of being focused on ourselves. Instead of being concerned about our wants and wishes and what might be in our best interest, we can be focused then on what the Lord wants and what might be good for others. I want you to look at this passage of Scripture again with the last couple of minutes we have here. Paul gives 15 descriptions of what love is. And what strikes me is how virtually all of these involve what Jesus referred to as dying or hating one's own life in this world. Look at it for yourself and see. Love is patient. Love is kind. And love is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked or easily provoked, it does not take into account the wrong suffered, it does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now as we're seeking spiritual growth, and as we pray for revival, it will have to look like this when it comes or else it will not be of the Spirit of God love is the fruit that the Spirit of God bears in the lives of those that follow His leadership and so if we are on the right track that there might be dying before there's reviving then it is not surprising to see that before there can be love there must be death and that death is my death. Amen. That's right. Amen. And yours. Amen. Let me give you just three examples here very quickly. And then the lesson will be yours. In this context, Paul says love is patient and 
love is not provoked. You take from verse 4 the description love is patient, and from verse 5 love is not provoked, or literally verse 4 says love suffers long. The phrase in verse 5 is also rendered love is not easily angered or love is not irritable. So you can see that these two easily provoked. It isn't easily irritated or angered. That's the flip side of suffers long and is patient. Now by nature, none of us likes to be interrupted when things are going well. We, we don't like delays in our plans. We have strong cravings for a trouble-free life. We tend to get irritated when our best laid plans go awry. Or when somebody messes up our best laid plans, we don't like traffic tie-ups on the highway when we have somewhere important to go like Walmart. We don't like overheated cars on vacation. We don't like babies crying in the night. We don't like any of those kind of things that rub us the wrong way. But Paul says that's not love. Love is just the opposite of that. Love is patience. Love is not easily provoked. And I'll tell you what, I have a lot to learn still in my life. Paul says love suffers long and it is not easily provoked. So what becomes of this whole side of us that suffers short? I mean, what, what about that? I mean, how many of us have a short fuse? How many of us would say this morning, I'm easily provoked, I easily complain, I easily grumble, I easily get angry, I easily criticize others? The answer to that, friend, is you've got to die. You hear me? You've got to die! Get back to So love like this is to die. If I'm to be like this, I am to die. I don't know how many times I'm going to say that. I guess I'll say it a couple more times. But look at this next thing. Paul says, love does not brag and is not arrogant. I mean, just take uh, the description of love in the middle of verse 4. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. We all love to be made much of, don't we? I mean, we like to be admired. We like it when people notice our successes and they miss our failures. We like it when we hear people say nice things about us. We don't like it, though, when people make fun of us or when they criticize us or when they laugh at us or humiliate us. So, so many of us, what we've done is we've developed strategies for minimizing our failures and maximizing our successes, and we tend to draw attention to the one and cover the other and then there are more crude ways of doing this like overt bragging. I mean just overtly bragging and boasting and developing a certain cocky swagger about ourselves. Or maybe even having an in-your-face kind of arrogance. I mean in America we have turned the vice of bragging into a virtue of entertainment. Self-pity even and boasting are both forms of pride. One is pride in the heart of the weak and the other is pride in the heart of the strong. But now Paul says, love does not brag. And it is not arrogant. It just doesn't speak much of itself, I suppose. It's not puffed up with its achievements. It isn't uh, too concerned even with its own hurts. Love is others directed. That's what it is. It's not self-consuming, which means that a massive craving in our heart must die if we are going to love. The glory-loving, self-exalting, attention-seeking, whining, pouting, self-pitying me, I must die. Now I'm talking about me. You all think I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. That's why Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. Alone in its self-absorbed, self-asserting, self-enhancing prison. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The fruit of love and all the people that will see Christ in that love. And the last thing here is that love does not seek its own, verse 5. Um, I don't think this means that it's wrong for us to be happy because in verse 3 Paul argues that if you don't love it profits you nothing. There's nothing wrong with us seeking what profits us. In other words, the point here is though, uh, what he's saying is that love does not seek its own personal 
private preference without reference to what may be good for the other person. I mean, ultimately, if I'm going to seek what I am convicted over, it must be what God is convicted over. Otherwise, otherwise, if it's not something that God has specifically spoken, then love says, prefer the other person and not self. Love seeks not its own. This is a call to love, friend. And this is indispensable to our works. All of our works mean nothing. Now we know that God demands works of action, works of obedience. In fact, we'll be judged in the last day by our works. But if we stand before the Lord in the judgment with our works, and we have not been transformed in our character to be people that feel and are motivated by love, our works will mean nothing to God. Love. Love. You know what? It may be that you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. I want to tell you why you should do as Jesus has commanded. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And you know why you should do that? The love of Jesus. The love of Jesus. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Won't you do that this morning? That's where the life of love begins. It begins by giving you life to Jesus and doing as Jesus has commanded. We'd love to help you in this if we can. While together this morning we stand and sing, we invite you to come to the Lord. Sing the